All right, we're back. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Mike Kelly, woohoo! Mike Kelly. Back up. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just uh, uh, undertake my answer again and say that I was living in a rural area, immediately in a, in a hamlet of a hundred or so people, in a larger community of a couple thousand, in a county that I was that I was uh, very involved in of a few thousand people, very rural community. Uh, and uh, while I studied French at university uh, and was pretty darn good at it, starting, uh, starting my service in the Peace Corps, uh, very few members of my community spoke French. Of you know, the hundreds so people in my hamlet who spoke French, or uh, uh, lived with me, two of them spoke French. And in the wider community of, of the few thousand people, several thousand people in my, in my, in my uh, county, um, a couple dozen spoke French. And, and that doesn't mean that I was even in contact with them. Um, and so the vast majority of people that I was around spoke local language, uh, whether it was Sapwe or Fong or, or Huelagbe. Like, uh, I needed to learn those languages and we needed to learn them quick, but I could only learn them so quickly and only so well. And so uh, right from the get-go, uh, it was difficult to talk to a lot of people uh, and and just and to express myself well, let alone in French, but especially in the local language. And that's high, highly alienating. It's 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 very isolating not to be able to talk to people around you, to get to get your work done, to even like express your emotions that day, to to share time with people. Um, there are ways to get around that, uh, physical communication, or just spend, try to spend quality time that's not conversational. But uh, nonetheless, it is. It was, it was highly isolating, and um, and uh, and really impacted my my, my mental health and, and sense of purpose in there. And uh, and it was only with due time that I was able to um, improve my local language and develop relationships that, that could work around um, my uh, my slow growth, my slow going. And it was in that that I really saw God at work. Because I could, I could give you dozens of examples where people gave me the benefit of the doubt because I was a foreigner. People gave me a little extra space knowing that I was learning. Or people gave me um, more of their time because they knew I had a mission, even if they didn't quite understand it. Or people gave me um, their, their patience and their commitment even when they know, even when they recognize I haven't quite figured out, let alone the fact that we have projects figured out together. Um, and uh, and those are and that's the dozens of examples that I could be talking about only touched the very top of the surface because I could never even recognize all the opportunities that people were graceful when I didn't even know that I was being ignorant when I didn't even know that I was committing a cultural faux pas, when I didn't know how, uh, how privileged and arrogant I was as some um, rich white guy showing up in a rural community trying to solve people's problems, which isn't exactly what I was trying to do, but, uh, or wanted to do, but in many cases it, it fundamentally boils down to that, people's perspectives. And so that kind of grace, that kind of daily forgiveness and, and willingness to continue in that struggle um, is one way that I saw God at work in other people. I love it. The idea of, of daily grace um, is something we all need yeah. right now. So uh, I know that there's a lot more that you have to share. And uh, we were supposed to have a Sunday school with you next week. Um, so we'll talk about ways that we can maybe creatively offer a presentation, maybe yeah. online, through YouTube, um, for you to share that out with our community. Uh, but before you are done, uh, can you share, are there things that we can be doing as a community? Um, and this list is just a list that you have. We have other things more timely or for right now, but just things in general we can be doing to help with food sustainability. Yes, one thing that we can be doing uh, here in Minnesota is, is committing to sustainable agriculture and a sense of food security in our own communities. One way that we can do that is, uh, when we have the means, is to uh, buy into community-supported agriculture. 
So instead of relying on spinach flown in from, you know, thousands and thousands of miles away, um, grown in, in, in East Asia, for example, or mushrooms grown, uh, or other vegetables grown in, in Argentina, um, or uh, you name it, we can support farmers growing here in Minnesota, growing using sustainable methods and uh, or, organic produce so that not only can we eat healthy, but we can support small farm farmers trying to make a living in our own communities in such a way that food isn't traversing thousands and thousands of miles and all the additional carbon emissions that creates in order for us to maintain our food security. So CSA means that instead of buying your weekly groceries, you pay up front to a small farmer before the season for your produce and then you get a box every week or two um, of sustainably produced organic vegetables. Um, and, uh, and I like this because it supports the local economy, it reduces carbon emissions, sustainable, sustainably produced, and, uh, and the vegetables are okay. so darn good. Um, there are some great examples, Big River Farms works speci uh, specifically with farmers of color and immigrant farmers. Uh, Common Harvest is also a very good mom and pop uh, operator that I personally know. Um, and, uh, and there are some other opportunities related to CSAs, uh, or at least in terms of um, food justice. There's a great organization called Imperfect Foods, where uh, we can reduce food waste by consuming products that groceries would otherwise, groceries, yeah, groceries would otherwise not sell. Uh, because Grocers love selling the reddest apples or the most pristine, greenest heads of lettuce. But guess what? We all know that even the reddest app, even, even the least reddest apples are just as edible as the reddest apples. And just a, a, a few spots, a brown spot or two on your lettuce uh, is probably not bad, as long as the lettuce hasn't gone bad. Um, imperfect foods. Uh, allows you to buy uh, food that could, is on the verge of spoiling so you can eat it right away, or just imperfect food, stuff, uh, food that doesn't look as pristine as groceries, grocery stores want them to be, uh, but you can eat them nonetheless. It reduces food waste because you purchase those foods and eat them at grocery stores or otherwise uh, for up. That's a great way to reduce food waste and improve food security in the Twin Cities. I, I use imperfect produce. We have it delivered to our house every other week. So, um, yeah, so, so go to Sean if you need more answers on that. <laughs> um, so, Noah, I want to thank you. I want to let people know that there are links to organizations on the worship guide online uh, through our Facebook page or through our website. If you want to find out more about uh, local things we can do for food sustainability, um, I want to thank you, Noah, for your service and for your you, activity in our community. We're so excited to have you here. <laughs> Very excited to share with you all today. Thank you, Noah. <laughs> well, I just want to take uh, a brief moment, and normally I wouldn't have my computer with me, um, but of course today is the day that the internet went down in the office, and I can't print anything. Um, so here we are. <laughs> and thank you to Mike Kelly for making the internet work in the sanctuary so that we can have worship together. Uh, our scripture came from the book of Genesis, and what's interesting about this scripture, and the reason I chose it, is to remind us that we are of the wilderness. That our origin story is deeply linked to the earth to creation, to the time in the garden. Not only are we of the, wilderness, of the wilderness, we are made for the wilderness. Uh, I was down in that a couple weekends ago at the women's retreat. I stay in the Hermitage, which is this little cabin out in the woods, and I do that because there isn't plumbing out there, and I want to make sure all of the rest of the wonderful women have access to plumbing um, in the main houses. And also, it's lovely. I can't deny it. It's like this lovely little cabin. But the first night I walked out there in the dark, it was about 11 o'clock at night, and you're walking in this path in the woods, and of course it's wilderness, there's no light. I didn't bring a flashlight, I had my phone, um, but I was fine, I'd done it before, uh, the year before. 
And as I was walking, I heard an animal, a big animal in the woods. It's like 11 o'clock at night, so I'm pretty sure it's not a deer. Um, and I get my flashlight from my phone and I shine to see if I can see an animal, not really wanting to find an animal. But I can hear it breaking branches and moving with heavy feet. So I just kind of calmly scoop my way, thinking animals smell fear, so trying to just be really brave, scoop my way to the uh, cabin and lock, well, I can't lock the doors with lock, but close the door and I made it. The next day, some of the women went out for a hike and they found uh, bear tracks in the snow. Um, and I just kept thinking, the bears are hibernating, the bears are hibernating. <laughs> they apparently are not hibernating. Uh, so sometimes the wilderness can feel very uh, concerning. It can cause us to, to fear the unknown and not know what is coming next. It can create a space of uh, wandering without vision, even. If you consider the stories of, of wilderness that we have in our scripture, we have uh, the Hebrew people wandering for 40 years in the desert. Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness experiencing every kind of temptation, which is what we honor and recognize in the Lent season, our solidarity of Christ with us. In this season of Lent, as we consider the journey and the wilderness before us, that has now changed as the world has changed, let us remember that Lent leads to Easter, and the worst thing is never the last thing. The story of Easter takes us all the way to the cross and to the empty tomb. This time of wandering in the wilderness is not a permanent state of being. There's always a hope ahead of us. Because the story of the wilderness is that the worst thing is never the last thing. And as we journey together, being people from the wilderness, born of the wilderness, created of the wilderness, we are equipped to wander in the wilderness. Scripture also teaches us that it is in the wilderness that God is reaching out to us. I love this scripture, and I ended it at kind of a funny place. You might have noticed it's mid-story, but Adam and Eve had, had just kind of ventured into a wilderness where they had taken the fruit and eaten it, and now they didn't know what was coming next. And what happened was they heard God coming, and so they, they hid because they didn't know what God would do or, or what uh, would come for them. They had this fear ahead of them. And God being God knew what they had done. God being God was aware of where they were. And God being God didn't start with what did you do? God started with where are you? Where are you? Adam and Eve were out in the wilderness afraid for what would come next. And God's question was, where are you? In the midst of their greatest fear, God was seeking them out. And so here, as we venture into the wilderness, God is seeking us. God is at work in our lives, in us and through us and around us. And maybe you're holding fear about COVID-19. Maybe you're holding a secondary fear of being alone, of isolation. Maybe you're holding fear about a broken relationship or financial crisis. Maybe it's a different kind of health concern, more pressing. Maybe your fear is having the kids home for another week because if you're in St. Paul, your kids have been home all week, last week for the strike, and now we're looking ahead to kids being home again this week. But God is standing in the wilderness with us. And God is asking, where are you? God is looking to be with us in the midst of our greatest fear because 
the worst thing is never the last thing. So things that we can do in the midst of this season, God at work in us and through us, uh, there's information online, but check in with people who might be vulnerable. Call. Check in with people who might not just be health, for health reasons be vulnerable, but vulnerable to isolation as a result of things being closed down. You can support our local food shelf, Keystone Community Services, or Sheridan Story that gets food to kids, uh, Simpson Housing Services and Project Home, all places that are dealing with vulnerable populations, both at risk of food security as a result of uh, what's happening in our, in our community, but also as a result of health and close quarters and, and sanitation and health challenges. We can also pray for one another. Outdoors is not banned. Uh, you can still go for a walk. You can still walk your neighborhood and pray for your neighbors. You can still go out and enjoy God's creation, practicing appropriate social distancing. <laughs> but in seriousness, your connection to God is not limited by the fact that we can't gather in this room. Your connection to God is a direct link because God is standing in the wilderness with you, looking for you, asking, where are you? The Easter story points us through the wilderness to resurrection. The story in Genesis is a story of our becoming. The story of the wilderness is a story of continuing that becoming. And let us continue to become. As God is at work with us in the wilderness. I invite you to join me in singing. Uh, responding together, I need thee every hour. Again, the worship guide has the words on the page. Those of you who are here, it should be on your insert. Let us sing. <laughs>
and our response, a wilderness wandering people. Receive now the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace, both now and forever. Serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.